This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. So I'm standing on a kind of hidden U.S. military base near the front lines, probably about 30 kilometers, actually, from the front lines of the final days of the Islamic Caliphate in Syria. ISIS has been defeated long ago, but they haven't stopped fighting. And there are still some several hundred ISIS fighters and their families, I guess, holed up in an area down along the riverbank, uh, very close to the Iraqi border in southern Syria. There are U.S. troops, sort of special operations guys, that are in that fight, <clears throat> along with Syrian uh, SDF, uh, that's uh, Syrian Defense Forces, uh, made up of the YPG uh, fighters from the, from Kurdistan, Kurdish YPG. Now the Kurdish YPG are Syrian and Iraqi and Iranian and Turkish, <clears throat> and they've all kind of come here uh, to fight. Mostly, m- most of the people here are Syrian, though, and. Uh, They are the ones who are really taking the fight to the enemy right now. The U.S., in my understanding, is not, like, actively engaged in going house to house and trying to root out ISIS. As a matter of fact, I don't know that really anybody's doing that at this point. I think what they've done is they've sort of sealed off a pretty small area of just a couple square kilometers and just won't let anybody in or out and are kind of starving them out at this point, probably the safest thing. They, they do have some hostages that ISIS has taken in there. There are some, I guess, Yazidi women and things like that that are still in there. They're still being liberated from time to time. So they don't really want to just bomb the place and just level it because that would... Uh, obviously kill a whole bunch of civilians. There's also the families of these ISIS fighters in there, women and children, and we don't want to kill them if we don't have to. So they may die of exposure or starvation, but I guess there are negotiations happening between the uh, coalition forces and ISIS to try to get them to give up and come out. ISIS wanted some... Uh, assurances or, or ability to maybe like go to Turkey and wanted safe passage or something like that. And the coalition forces said, absolutely not. It, either it's 100% surrender or you die. And so it looks like they're probably going to die. Most of those that are left in there right now are foreign fighters from, gosh, Canada, France, you know, Eastern Europe, Germany, Czech Republic, stuff like that. Guys that have come from around the world to fight for ISIS and now could not blend back into the local population uh, because they don't, you know, they're not from here. They don't look like the people, don't sound like the people. And so they're kind of down to their last stand. Now, I understand that there were quite a few ISIS fighters who did decide to kind of melt back into the local population before it got this to this point. Uh, we were told that the route we drove down yesterday went right through an area that had a whole bunch of those kind of guys, and we kind of felt that coming through there as we were driving through some of the small towns uh, coming down to the front. Boy, the the stares that we got, the, the way that people looked, just uh, was not friendly. And so likely, I think, that many of those guys had been ISIS fighters. You know, one of the strange things that I'm learning about all this is just how 
easily these fighters switch sides, change allegiances, uh, just based on who they think is going to win. So you got a guy that maybe was a <clears throat> sheep herder or something, and when ISIS came in and they basically gave him the option of becoming an ISIS fighter or being crucified, and so he probably you know, decided it was maybe a, a good thing that he become an ISIS fighter. But uh, then the uh, Turkish, let's say, uh, forces came down and surrounded them, let's say, and all of a sudden they get a phone call and uh, they say, hey, you guys need to be part of the Turkish, or, well, it's, it's uh, the fighters that the United States actually was arming and supporting under Barack Obama, which turned out to be mostly guys who were formerly al-Nusra, guys that we had been fighting during the Iraq War, and became the, uh, I think it's the Syrian Defense Army, is it, um, SDA. I think that's what it's called. I'm, I'm kind of blanking on that right now. Anyway, um, so these guys, this guy, that were ISIS fighters, decide, hey, I guess we'll be Syrian Defense Army, or SDA now, and they switch sides, and uh, next thing you know, they're working for the Turks. And so, they, uh, and, and fighting ISIS. Um, it's a very fluid battlefield, very fluid out here. And, uh, man, talking to some of the local guys who have been fighting out here for some time, it is really kind of astounding uh, just how complex and dangerous this battlefield is. They say that, uh, we, we were told many times last night, we got to this base after dark, we drove in here uh, following the uh, YPG guide who has taken us where we were supposed to go and pulled into this base and started looking around. This is a, uh, we're, we're very near the air, some oil fields and this base was kind of a gated community for the oil field workers before the war started. And so it's a kind of self-contained, perfect for a military base, really. It's got housing, it's got uh, a school, a mosque, a church, all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and it was easily converted into a military base. They put HESCO barriers all around it. I'm walking along the barriers now. Uh, <laughs> they put up guard posts and uh, moved everybody into the the housing units. Nice little apartments, you know, two, three bedroom apartments. You know, simple. They they have generator power here. Little bit of Wi-Fi uh, if you get real lucky, and that's that's about all they have right now. There's actually uh, one building that's a, a restaurant and a little little camp store kind of thing um, with really important stuff like spicy ketchup and cooking oil <laughs> and not uh, and and of course red bull i mean uh, energy drinks are like currency out here so anyway we pulled in and we started looking around and realized whoa this is not a ypg base this is a us military base because there's a lot of us equipment around inside here and uh, so we parked our vehicles and we're kind of waiting for the word of where we were supposed to go. And next thing you know, uh, the Americans got word that we were there, probably because, I mean, it's, imagine how jarring it is. You're a U.S. special operator at a secret military base in Syria. And one day, a bunch of civilian Land Rovers and stuff come rolling in. Uh, one night, and they've got a old up-armored Humvee with them, and there's a 13-year-old boy riding in the turret of the Humvee, <laughs> and you see a couple of teenage girls and some women and everything. It looks like a bunch of tourists just showed up, if it weren't for the fact that we've got a whole bunch of, uh, obviously, you know, survival gear and that sort of thing strapped to the vehicles, but pretty pretty jarring for those guys, and they kind of freaked out, uh, gra grabbed Dave Eubank, our, our leader here, and uh, pulled him into a meeting, uh, and I use meeting kind of loosely, it was more of an interrogation, stuck him in a room, 
and wanted to know who you are, why are you here, how'd you get here, uh, why are you carrying weapons, uh, and things like that. And um, we're really unhappy about the fact that we just showed up at their base. I, I guess that's understandable uh, on one level. On another level, hey, we're here to help, and they don't own this country. I mean, the U.S. military is here and is doing good stuff. Probably has, every, I mean, uh, without a doubt, has, has every reason to be kind of perplexed and maybe even a little worried if we are a bunch of civilians just come rolling in here and they don't know who we are or where we came from or whatever. But, I, I mean, it's just really surreal. It was very surreal. So after a couple-hour meeting and um, a whole bunch of back and forth, and the, at first the special ops guys were extremely unfriendly to uh, our group, they sort of, I think, maybe figured out who we are a little bit, probably Googled us, if I had to guess. And Dave had made a few phone calls to high-ranking people he knows, and so maybe they got a phone call and told them to lay off. But they came back a little later and sort of apologized, actually gave us some medicine that we could pass out to the IDPs that we will see later today. Anyway, things got a little better after that. We ended up sleeping in one of the little apartments uh, just on the floor, kind of camping out. Uh, we had, uh, they, they served us a, a little bit of, uh, oh no, we didn't, they didn't serve us dinner. We, we went over to the restaurant and they had hamburgers and I had chicken fingers and um, halfway decent food for being in the middle of nowhere, french fries, that sort of thing. And then we, we went in, went to sleep in our sleeping bags, and then uh, we kind of all slept in that on the floor of this, this apartment. It was fine, kind of packed in there. Uh, I slept pretty well, actually. And then uh, got up this morning, had a little briefing with the YPG commander about what we're going to do today. The plan is to go out to one of the IDP collection sites, kind of where they, uh, the, maybe the second place they go once they, they, they surrender. I mean, there's still hundreds every day, if not thousands, that are coming out of the area where ISIS is or trying to escape. Uh, unfortunately, some of them are actually ISIS sympathizers who have been, they've had a real problem with suicide bombers. Actually, the other day they had five female suicide bombers who, came up wearing their burqas uh, with a group of uh, IDPs that were trying to escape and then detonated their suicide vests when they got around uh, SDF forces, the, the Yapaga forces. And uh, I think they said 19 YPG soldiers were killed in that engagement, or in those various explosions. Uh, we are being warned that there are hidden... IEDs, trip wires, everywhere down there. They said, man, don't even turn around if you can help it. Uh, they said, don't flip a light switch. Don't pick anything up. Be very careful where you step. There are, uh, they even showed us some uh, trip wire kind of uh, uh, field expedient detonators that had been made that they they'd captured down there from ISIS where they uh, wind this wire together and then strip the insides of the two pair, the two pieces of wire, and put a tiny little piece of surgical tubing in between there to kind of hold them apart. And they do that about every three inches down this wire and just have a whole string of them. And they just string it along right on the ground. And man, you can't even see it. It's just the same color as the dirt. And if you step on that thing and compress that surgical tubing and the wires touch, then the bomb goes off. And, um, one of the guys told us, he said, I came within six inches of hitting an explosively formed penetrator yesterday uh, and just saw the tripwire just in time. So they're cautioning us to be very, very careful if we get down there by the front line. And believe me, we intend to be. There's no two ways about that. Uh, we've seen this before in Mosul and in Sinjar and other, elsewhere. And uh, there's nothing I want less than to get my legs blown off today. So uh, I'm going to be very, very careful and uh, plan on going home with all my parts and pieces. So thanks for listening. That is the update for today. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments of this podcast. I'm sorry that I can't uh, get any video out for this particular episode, but um, we just don't have the bandwidth and I'm on a military base where... If I pull my camera out, they might rip my arms off. 
So it's just going to have to suffice for audio today. And I hope uh, you all will keep listening and keep watching. I'll get some video out as soon as I can. Uh, God bless you all. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing here. And uh, thanks for listening to The Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.